I'm going to start from the present day and work backwards very quickly. There were two excellent series on television recently. I, the first look at, in single episodes at individual European countries from above. The second, uh, larger from the air and sometimes with graphic um, reproductions. Uh, and the second looked at Russia alone, but that actually took five episodes because even today in its much reduced size, the Russian Federation overwhelms all foreigners by its sheer vastness and diversity spanning 11 time zones. Two hundred years ago, the Russian Empire stretched west to east from Poland to Alaska. Alaska was sold to the United States of America in 1867 for $7,200,000. Russia was yet to expand further south. By the end of the 19th century, it would extend north to south from the Arctic Circle to the Black Sea and its borders with Turkey. Persia, Afghanistan, and China. Can you? Oh, we do have one Ukrainian there. Can you do it quickly? I'll do it. European and Asian, um, you know, by the 1890s, only one quarter of the empire was in European Russia which was home to three quarters of its population. It was an empire characterized by immense diversity of climate and terrain, of language and culture, of ethnicity and nationality, of religions and customs. According to the census of 1897, which is the first reliable census, the one 30 years younger, you know, earlier was not very reliable. While 69.3% of the population were Russian Orthodox, there were also almost 30, 14 million Muslims, 11.1%, nearly 11 and a half million Latin Catholics, 9.1%, slightly over 5.2 million, 5 million Jews, 4.2%, and the largest Protestant denomination were the Lutherans, over three and a half million. One man's absolute and supreme will governed over one sixth of the world's landmass. From 1801 until his death in 1825, the grandson of Catherine the Great, Tsar Alexander I, ruled this empire by divine right as emperor and autocrat of all the Russians. In my final years of teaching history and politics, most of my A-level students, that is those aged between 16 and 19, came from countries which had been in the former Soviet Union. I accepted gladly the challenge to teach them in their final year, a thematic paper on Russia and its rulers. Whoever that is, please, could you mute yourself? Let's see if we can do that. How do you mute this? Thank you. Um, Russia and its rulers, 1855 to 1964. The syllabus required a comparative approach between the Tsarist and communist regimes the nature of government and the methodology of governance through repression and reform, the lives and working conditions of their people, subject nationalities and the policy of Russification, agrarian reform and industrialization, and also the impact of Russia's wars. Sadly, um, sadly, I cannot cover all this in one hour but shall need to confine myself to an essentially old-fashioned, top-down,
top-down approach. Looking at the governance of Russia, the course taken by its rulers of repression and reform and of reaction and modernization. The huge debate between Slavophiles, uh, or Slavophil, and Westernizers, the literary legacy, revolutionary movements, working conditions, subject nationalities and ethnic minorities, and these so much else must be either omitted or just slightly referred to. The whole series, this whole series is all entirely dedicated to Victorian Britain. Russia needs much more than one hour to do the subject justice. Maybe um, uh, I should like to suggest that um, uh, one of our Russian members might kindly offer a future talk. I should like to suggest a series next year that would include 19th century Europe as well as British history. In 1812, the self-styled Emperor of the French, Napoleon Bonaparte, led his Grande Armée of over 600,000 men into the heart of the Russian motherland. Alexander's mother had nicknamed the, him the Corsican cannibal and refused him marriage to two of her daughters. The Tsar responded to the invader by ordering a scorched earth policy, knowing that Bonaparte's army fed off the land. He refused to give battle until the French closed in on Moscow. The Battle of Borodino was an indecisive bloodbath that failed to stop the French from entering Moscow. Alexander ordered the former capital to be set to flames. With his supply lines overstretched, Bonaparte had no alternative but to retreat and did so too late. The Russian winter was what ultimately defeated Napoleon's forces, and it did the armies a far more brutal conqueror of Europe 130 years later. At the head of the Allied coalition, Alexander defeated the French at Leipzig. He pursued the small remnant of the Grand Armée all the way back to Paris, entering the French capital in triumph. At the Congress of Vienna, he gained the former Kingdom of Poland, while his annexation of Finland was also confirmed. Alexander I died suddenly on the 19th of November, 1825 in Southern Russia. There was some question as to who would succeed him. His two daughters had died in childhood and he left no heir. Next in line was his brother Constant, Constantin governor of Poland. However, his morganomatic marriage in 1820 was only allowed by Alexander on the condition that Constantine renounced his claim to the throne, albeit privately. This was formalized in 1822. The secrecy of this resulted in coins being minted in, with Const Constantine's face after his brother's death while the state council insisted on taking oaths to him. Constantine then sent letters to his younger brother, Nicholas, and to their mother confirming his renunciation. Those army officers who'd fought in Europe and entered Paris had become acquainted with the liberal ideas of the Enlightenment. Believing that Constantine would be more liberal than Nicholas, about 3,000 officers refused to take the oath for Nicholas and organized the march on Senate Square 
on the 14th of December, 1825, under the banner Constantine and Constitution. These became known as the Decemberists. They arrived too late to prevent government officials from taking the oath. Not wanting a massacre to inaugurate his reign, Nicholas tried negotiation and conciliation. Their refusal was followed by violence from supporters and finally artillery to loyal to the new emperor prevailed. The Decemberists were interrogated, tried and convicted. Five leaders were hanged in the last public execution in Imperial Russia. Nicholas's repressive and autocratic rule over his empire for the first, the next 29 years pr pr proved pivotal to the future of Russia. He set up the machinery of the late Tsarist regime, the virtual stagnation and in industrialization through his reign, throughout his reign, led to the future drive to end Russia's relative backwardness, which lasted until Stalin. Finally, Nicholas II led his country into the Crimean War, which only demonstrated graphically the degree of that backwardness. Nikolai Pavlovich had a very military frame of mind. And even as Tsar, he was always portrayed in various uniforms. Lacking Alexander's spiritual and intellectual breadth, Nicholas stuck rigidly to what became known as the Nicholas system. One Tsar, one faith, one nation. Being a convinced Orthodox believer, Nicholas took seriously <clears throat> his sole responsibility to God for his paternal and complete autocracy over Russia. Repression and inflexibility seemed self-evidently necessary to him after the Decemberist revolt. The Tsar was nicknamed Nicholas of the Big Stick. Following his visit to Russia in 1829, the Marquis de Custin, thank you, um, Marquis de Custin saw only two possible interpretations for Nicholas's style of rule. If the emperor has no more of mercy in his heart than he reveals in his policies, then I pity Russia. If on the other hand, his true sentiments are really superior to his acts, then I pity the emperor. He came back from Russia with a very negative, impre with very negative impressions. The nature of its government is interference, negligence <clears throat> and corruption. In 2002, the Marquis was fictitiously portrayed in, as a time traveling European in the much acclaimed and beautifully choreographed film, Russian Ark, which I commend to you. Meanwhile, Russian intellectual life was caught into rival camps. Flower files saw Russian identity in the deep roots of Russian uniqueness, language, religion, and culture. Various differing schools of Westernization, many of them embraced, of whom embraced liberal or socialist ideas, looked to European models of society, culture, and politics to provide the way forward out of Russia's autocracy, insularity, and, bar and backwardness. Sadly, I do not have time to explain, explain these, explore these tonight. Sergei Uvarov was appointed Deputy Minister of National Education in 1832 and shortly afterwards promoted to head that ministry until 1848, ennobled as a count in 1846. As Minister of Education and President of the Academy of Sciences, Uvarov was instrumental in educational reforms that granted more autonomy to universities as well as the founding of St. Petersburg University. Leslie Chamberlain, whose biography of him came out last year, 
has called him the father of Russian conservatism. Tracing his ideology all the way down to President Putin. In, in 1833, Kantubar demanded that education be conducted uh, with faith in the principles of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. It is our common obligation to ensure that the education of the people be conducted according to supreme intention of our, to the supreme intention of our august monarch in the joint spirit of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. I'm convinced that every professor and teacher being permeated by one or and the same opinion and devotion to the throne of fatherland will use all his resources to become a worthy tool for the government and earn its complete confidence. His tripartite formula was the conservative response to the revolutionary tri triad of liberté, égalité, fraternité, and it was fully embraced by Tsar Nicholas I and by his grandson Tsar Alexander III, as we shall see. Orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality were the embodiment of what distinguished Russia from Western Europe. The word Norodnost can be translated as nationality or nationhood, but both but include both the sense of belonging to a nation and the national character, quality or spirit. Uvarov summarized this objective as to turn Russians back to Russian ways. That required the defense against Western encroachment of the originality and uniqueness of Russian of the Russian people, as well as of the fundamental values of Russian culture and society. This was the demand of the Slavophiles. Autocracy demanded the maintenance of the absolute sovereignty and power of the Tsar, for which he regarded the continuation of serfdom as essential. First and foremost in that triad was orthodoxy, and indeed to invert that order equaled idolatry. Orthodoxy was not, however, to be understood merely as the religious creed and practice of the Orthodox Church, but the inner pledge of the Russian people. Orthodoxy as the everyday faith of the Russian people can be respected also by others, even by non-Christians, wrote Uvaro. That is, to say, say, that is, so to speak, the inner pledge of the life of the Russian people. It is completely possible to respect it and even make up to it while remaining in the sphere of personal conscience, a complete and irreconcilable opponent of ecclesiastical dogmatic orthodoxy. His Imperial Majesty's own chancellery expanded to become the instrument and agency of the Tsarist autocracy. It was transformed into a large administrative body after Nicholas created its six sections in 1826. The first oversaw the majestic decrees and orders, the reports of the empire's provincial governments and the handling of petitions while the second set about the codification of imperial laws. The third section was originally for the investigation of corruption that became the repressive police force, which handled political crimes, censorship and religious sects. It ran a, a huge network of spies and informers with the help of the gendarme. Thousands of citizens were kept under strict surveillance. The fourth section oversaw education and charities, while the fifth looked after the state-owned serfs, 
the sixth section was founded in 1842 to manage Caucasian civil matters and development. Count Mikhail Mikhailovich Speransky had drafted reforming legislation for Alexander I. And then was exiled from 1812 to 18, until 1816 as the Tsar um, changed course following Napoleon's invasion. By now, that is by the 1820s, a more conservative figure, he was appointed the head of the second section with the responsibility for the codification of Russian laws on which he also wrote some important commentaries. His full collection of laws was published in 1830 in 65 volumes of some four, of some 600, sorry, of some 800 pages each. These volumes were meant to get, make rulings throughout Russia more uniform. They form the basis of, for the collection of laws of the Russian Empire, the positive law for the whole Russian Empire. That's the wrong order, sorry. Nothing wrong there, I'm sorry, wrong order. It was Leon Trotsky who once referred to war as a locomotive of history, meaning that it was the cause of change and often rapid change, as in the First World War, which brought him and his party to government in 1917. In that case, Russia faced imminent defeat, but in the Crimean War, Russia suffered the ignominy of defeat on its own territory. Despite its massive resources and manpower, Russia lacked the industrial capacity to supply a modern army and also the roads and railways needed to transport men and supplies to the front line. Tsar Alex Nicholas I died in January 1855 after catching a chill reviewing his troops in freezing conditions. I'll let you just read that quotation because I think it's quite revealing um, for one moment. Father to son advice. So, um, his son and heir Alexander II was keen to bring hostilities to an end and did so through the Treaty of Paris in 1856. In his manifesto, Alexander II, and I want to thank, by the way, for these, the next portraits, uh, Natalia, for um, sending me these. Including a, an amazing collection, actually, of uh, photographs of paintings for, of the coronation of Alexander the Second. Uh, Alexander the Second. In his manifesto, Alexander the Second promised reform, and he was already considering proposals concerning the end of serfdom, as well as changes to education and the legal system. Sorry. Sorry. This shouldn't be the way to do it, but there we are. There we are. Oh, try this way. Not oh, great. He realized that something needed to be done, not just to save the dynasty, but to drag Russia into the modern world where it can compete with its economic rivals and not face defeat in a future war with other with the other great powers. The new Tsar advisors argued that Russia's surf-based surf economy could no longer compete with industrialized nation, nations such as Britain. 
in Russia, the serfs equaled about 44% of the, Russia's population. They were the property of a little over 100,000 land-owning lords and their religious foundation or religious foundations of the Tsar himself. Alexander saw the landed gentry, that the landed gentry were nervous about likely peasant uprisings and told them that it was better to order the abolition of serfdom by his edict than eventually lose control of the situation and have serfdom abolished by riotous crowds. He argued the existing order of serfdom cannot remain unchanged. It is better to abolish serfdom from above than to wait for the time when it will begin to abolish itself from below. In 1861, Alexander proclaimed the liberation, emancipation of about 20, 20 to 23 million privately held serfs. Such emancipation was therefore on a much larger scale than that of the four million slaves in America, which was proclaimed by Abraham Lincoln two years later. The Russian term simply meant that an unfree person who, unlike a slave, historically could be sold only with his land attached. Slavery had been abolished by Peter the Great. According to the Emancipation Edict of the 19th of February, 1861, and I think I'm using old style dating here, the serfs were not only freed, but granted a certain portion of the nobles' estates. The nobles who lost their estates were to be compensated by the government. The former serfs usually remained in the village communes, but they were required to make annual redemption payments to the government for 49 years, at the end of which time the land was to be their property. There's some parallel with the Irish situation at the end of the century, you know, um, as we looked at before. The government compensated former owners of serfs by issuing bonds to them. The village communes would allot a share of the village land to each peasant. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in return, each peasant was compelled to repay the annual sum to the government. However, this turned out to be very unsatisfactory in practice. Firstly, the newly emancipated serb peasants found that their share of the village land was often insufficient to keep them above the level of grinding poverty. It has been estimated that only one third of the total area of agricultural land was given to the village communes, while more than one third was kept by the state and the imperial family, and a further quarter was still kept by the nobility. Secondly, their annual sums to the government were often heavier than the dues or rents they had formerly paid Paid to the nobles. Therefore, they ended up poorer. While being saddled with 49 years with a serious financial burden. Furthermore, the peasants were now liable for taxation like any other free man. Thirdly, the land of the village commune was often infertile because the nobles were allowed to give up the poorest parts of their estates to the peasants and kept the best parts for themselves. Fourthly, the village commune was created in every peasant village community to oversee in redemption payments and share out land equitably. It kept the village land as collective property by the village commune. The peasant was tied to his land until it was paid, until um, the, 
sorry, tithe the land until it was paid for, while the commune also acted as a court in matters involving land disputes. Finally, the land, the amount of land each peasant family received was initially small, about eight and a half acres. As successive generations inherited the land, it had to be shared out amongst more peasant families. The amount of land remained constant, but those farming it increased in number. Very soon, the peasants were experiencing land hunger. Rapid population growth meant that the size of allotments was decreasing by an average of 5.24 hectares in 18, from an average of 5.24 hectares in 1861 to 2.84 in 1900. As a police report noted in 1905, very often the peasants do not have enough allotment land and cannot during the year feed themselves, clothe themselves, heat their homes, keep their tools and livestock secure, in other words, keep seed for sowing, and lastly pay all their taxes and debts. From about 1881 and increasingly from 1894, peasants were financially obliged to move to the industrial cities to find work in order to send back money to those who were still trying to make a living off the land. Others sold up their better off, so their better off counterparts known as kulaks and moved the whole family to become workers in industry. Thus, while the peasant discontent increased and peasant riots continued, the poverty of the peasantry ultimately contributed to urban overcrowding and thereby to industrial unrest. The Crimean War was a catalyst for the emancipation, but this was just the beginning. The abolition of legal and judicial control of the gentry over their serfs required a new system of local government. The administration of the countryside was dominated by the nobles. The Zemstvo, statute of 1864, created district and provincial assemblies Jemsva. The members of the district assemblies were elected by the inhabitants of each rural district, peasants and nobles alike. These members were then elected delegates to the provincial assemblies. This system election needed to be cut down, it was intended to cut down the power of the nobles and gave more rights to the um, non-noble classes. The assemblies were responsible for the administration of local education and public health, the upkeep of roads and bridges, the encouragement of industry, agriculture, and the election of justices and peace. This was the first experiment in self-government in Russia and encouraged the Russians to demand, demand for more, more political power in the future. In 1870, this reform was extended to the creation of new town councils, Dumi, which were elected by property owners and taxpayers. The new Dumi were made responsible for the general welfare of the towns with powers to pursue municipal economic development. Ah, sorry, right. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, before 1864, the law courts in Russia were very corrupt. Oh, wait, 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 this is all right. Okay. Uh, before 1864, the courts in Russia were very corrupt and bribery was common. The Russian judicial system was biased in favor of the aristocracy and those with influence.
the peasants' chance of justice was very remote. They, there, were, there was neither jury nor lawyers, and the judge sat in closed session examining only the written evidence, never actually saw the victim. Indeed, judges often had little or no legal training. The Tsar published the reforms of the legal system in November 1864 with the intention to establish in Russian, Russia courts of justice that are swift, fair, merciful, and equal to all our subjects to raise the authority of the judiciary to give it the independence that benefits it. A court hierarchy was set up from the magistrate's court up to the Senate, which dealt with the varying degrees of offenses. Judges were to be trained and well paid. Which made them un unlikely to accept bribes. The Tsar appointed the judges, and they held these positions of authority for life. The rights of the defendant were to be considered for the first time. Now, the courtroom was open to the public to watch the cases unfold. This attracted huge numbers and was very popular. Trial by jury was introduced in criminal cases, but not in cases of treason. All Russians were to be regarded as equal before the law. The judiciary was separated from the Ministry of Power and made it dependent. However, the government could, through the Minister of the Interior, influence judicial decisions. The secret police set up by Nicholas I, the third section, could and did overrule judicial judgments and interfere in the process of justice. Other reforms included the introduction of a national conscription system, abolition of military colonies, the relaxation of the censorship of books and periodicals, and an attempt to establish university autonomy and widen the basis of entry into secondary schools. The government also tried to stimulate economic development by building more railways and giving financial subsidies to industry. In the financial sphere, Russia established the state bank in 1866, which put the national currency on a firmer footing. The Ministry of Finance supported development of railways, which facilitated vital export activity, but it was cautious and moderate in its foreign ventures. In 1880, Alexander turned once more to reform. He abolished the third section and made plans to summon a general commission, which would include representatives from the Zemsva. This general commission would not be parliament, but would be a consultative voice when the Tsar required it, but it never met. There were eight attempts on the life of son Alexander II and the last succeeded. On the 1st of March, 1881, Alexander was traveling in a closed carriage back to the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. An unarmed Cossack, Cossack sat in the, with the coach driver and another six Cossacks escorted from behind on horseback. They were followed by police officers and sl on sledges. Along the route, he was watched by members of an anarchist group of Norodniki, known as the People's Will. On the street corner near the Ekaterina Canal, Sofia Perovskaya gave the signal the two colleagues to throw their bombs at the Tsar's carriage. The bombs missed the carriage and instead landed amongst the Cossacks. Tsar was unhurt, 
but insisted on getting out of the carriage to check the condition of the injured men. While he was standing with the wounded Cossacks, another terrorist threw his bomb and the bar was fatally wounded. Alexander, his son, the new Tsar Alexander III, spoke in succession manifesto of the base and wicked murder of a Russian sovereign by unworthy monsters from the people, done in the very midst of that faithful people. That is a terrible and shameful matter, unheard of in Russia, which has darkened our entire land with grief and terror. The new Tsar ordered the construction of a church to be built on the spot in which his father had been martyred. And the um, monument there in the church um, marks the point, spot where, at least approximately, where the Tsar was. Um, where the bomb, where the bomb um, was thrown at the Tsar, or rather, rather where, where he was fatally wounded. On the surface, it would appear that the Tsar was murdered because he was prepared to carry out the bomb. This was certainly the view taken by his son, Alexander the Third. Alexander III was shocked and horrified by the assassination of his father, due, he believed, to the weak and reforming policies adopted by Alexander II, which had permeated, pandered, sorry, had pandered to the masses. In his accession manifesto, he declared his intention to reaffirm the autocracy. A new state of emergency statute initiated uh, an immediate crackdown. It gave governmental administrators extrajudicial and wide executive powers. They could issue fines without recourse to the courts, make arrests on their own, and sequestrate property at will. Much legal jurisdiction was transferred to military tribunals. The secret police abolished by Alexander II was reinstated, reorganized and strengthened into an agency known as the Akhana and placed under the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The Akhana soon set up a network of spies on any groups deemed subversive and in opposition to the regime. Universities lost most of their freedoms gained by under Alexander II, and censorship was tightened considerably. The right to universities to appoint their own professors was abolished. New legislation required the government's approval for new services to be taught. No student was allowed to be taught history unless he had permission from the Minister of Education. Schools were also forced to raise their fees to prevent the poorer classes gaining an education. In 1897, the illiteracy rate was, was 79%. The Tsar pursued policies which aimed to restore Russia to the pre-1851 situation. It was not possible to reverse the emancipation of the Tsars, but it was possible to reverse the power of the Zanzva and their powers for, for, were distinctly curbed. In 1889, the minimal powers of, of the Zanzva were removed, local justices of the peace were also removed and replaced by a system of land captains who were directly appointed and answerable to the Minister of the Interior. The Zanzva Act of 1890 revised the 1864 law by having the elections of rural assemblies segregated on a class basis. One, nobles. Two, other classes except, patients, uh, except peasants. Three, peasants. Ownership of land was required 
In order to vote for class one and two, the peasants voted indirectly. Women and Jews were specifically disenfranchised. Even in the so-called Jewish pale, a huge Jewish ghetto in Western Russia, only one tenth of the officials were Jewish. The Jews suffered from a level of anti-Semitism hitherto. Can you open that comment there? I try, I'll do it. I'll start that bit again. The Jews suffered from a level of anti-Semitism hitherto not experienced in Russia. In 1881, a wave of pogroms broke out in nearly 100 different localities. In many instances, these outbreaks were instigated by or connived by, at by the police. At this time, there were some 650 anti-Jewish laws on the statute books. New legal restrictions were constantly added to the books. Jews could not settle in, in rural districts. Hail was constricted. Quotas for Jewish students were introduced in the schools. Could you please mute? Jews were excluded from the legal profession, the Ziemstvos, Ziemstva, and municipal governments. No Jewish craftsman was allowed outside the pale, while some 20,000 Jewish craftsmen were expelled from the city of Moscow in 1891. Jews could not use Christian names to hide their religious identity. The great Jewish exodus to the United States and to Palestine began at this time initiating the kibbutz movement in what is now Israel. There was a systematic persecution of ethnic minorities in Poland and the Baltic provinces, a policy of brutal Russification was inaugurated. The primary object of Russification was to rid Russia of Western ideas that Alexander III believed had weakened the nation and reduced its national identity. Russification was not new to Russia. What made Alexander's policy so different was the intensity of it and the attempt to give it some form of academic and intellectual foundation. I have very nearly finished, by the way. Russification had no time for ethnic groups that were more concerned about their cultures at the expense of Russia as a whole. To be loyal to Russia and therefore to the Tsar, you had to be a Russian first that, rather than, for example, the Kazakh or Georgian. Any support for national identities was seen as a weakening of Russia's true identity. The Orthodox Church supported Russification insofar as the policy called on Poles to convert to the Orthodox Church from Catholicism and for Muslims in Central Asia to do the same. It was an offense to convert from the Orthodox Church to another faith, and divorce could only be granted through a church court. Russian dissenters could not build new places of worship or propagate their faith. Conversion to the dissenters brought imprisonment or and even exile to Siberia, while proselytizing missionary work by Orthodox priests was promoted. The Roman Catholic clergy of Poland were constantly persecuted. Lutheran ministers in the Baltic regions were brought under indictment for various offences against the Orthodox Church and government authorities. Peter the Great had placed the church under the direct control of the government and abolished the patriarchate. The Holy Synod created by Peter was a mixture of archbishops and civil servants. The most important figure in the synod was the procurator directly answerable to the Tsar. The Holy Synod was to preach obedience to the Tsar. This obedience was meant to be transmitted from the bishops down to the clergy in the villages. If all Russians became Orthodox, that would, greatly expand, would have greatly expanded the power of the Holy Synod, a body that was created to give its support to an expansion of the power of the Tsar. A primary theme of Russification was the power of the monarch. Orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality thus became a motto, the motto again. And indeed, that motto and the concept of Russification went back to the same formulator, Count Sergei Kuvarov. 
One major success during the reign of Alexander III was the acceleration of industrial development, <clears throat> which continued under his son, Nicholas II. Railway cons railways construction was finally taken, taken off in the 1860s, stimulating the economy and accelerating urbanization. The urban population, this is Moscow, um, literally doubled in 30 years from 7.3 million in 1867 to 18.6 million in 1897. Russia had nearly every natural resource with the notable exception of rubber. Mining of its vast mineral wealth was to provide her with the raw materials she needed to become a major industrial power. The state took the leading role in building up, financing and managing nearly all the new industries. The Russo-German Nikolai Bunga was Minister of Finance from 1881 until 1886, and then Chairman of the Council of Ministers, Prime Minister in, in sort of, from 1887 until his death in 1895. Bunga interested himself in the strengthening of the Russian economy and drew up plans for a national system of income tax. He encouraged Russian industry by the imposition of a new small of some tariff protection and continued to improve transport and communications by further railway building. He also forbade child labor and established the factory inspectorate to improve conditions for workers. Bunga was of Lutheran Baltic German parentage, as was Count Sergei Vita. Vita's father had converted to orthodoxy on his marriage. Vita became Minister of Finance in 1893 and stayed in that office for 10 years before being, becoming Chairman of the Council of Ministers. He had been in railway management for 20 years and was keen to expand the railways and concentrate his energetic energies on rapid industrialization, seemingly unconcerned how heavily the burden of new taxes fell on the rural peasantry or on the swift increase of foreign loans and borrowing. The expectation was that as Russian industry advanced, all debts would be repaid to promote greater foreign faith in the currency and to encourage foreign investment, the ruble was elevated to the gold standard. In the last 15 years of the 19th century, industrial output nearly trebled. The new century witnessed even more extensive development. It was in these years that coal mining and great iron and steel plants developed in the Ukraine. Oil near Baku were the Nobel brothers were investors. Textiles around Moscow and engineering in the capital of St. Petersburg. Russia's coal, iron, steel, and oil production tripled between 1890 and 1900. Her GNP grew more quickly than any other major European power. Railways, railway mileage almost doubled giving Russia the most track of any nation other than the United States. Between 1891 and 1901, the total length of Russian railways rose from 30,000 kilometers to over 56,000 kilometers. The greatest project of the period was the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway linking Moscow with Vladivostok. It was started in 1891 and completed in 1905 and ran 5,785 miles, 9,310 kilometers. Final paragraph. The Trans-Siberian Railway in itself stimulated the Russian iron and timber industry. 
with a slump after its completion. Signing, following the signing of the dual alliance with France in 1893, Russia was provided with huge French loans for industrial development. The net result was that by 1914, Russia ranked fifth among the industrial nations of the world in terms of industrial production. I just wanted to end by showing you some curious a uh, couple of slides, which I thought might be interesting. Um, some of you may know of St. Barnabas Church in Oxford. Um, and the first vicar of there, uh, Father Montague Newell, had an amazing, I discovered, uh, well, I was shown by the parish priest, an amazing um, photograph album, which includes these photographs. I don't know what's happened to the markings on the bottom of this. I do apologize. Um, but um, photographs of... Uh, Firstly, of Moscow in the 1860s or 1870s, these two. And then finally, of St. Petersburg, maybe um, Father Nikolai might even know what that monastery is, though the picture is very bad, um, and uh, in Russia. And uh, so I'm just going to, that's the end. Thank you very much for joining us. That's a plate in, I'm looking out across the sitting room. Uh, and 